Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Savitz, Senior Advisor at the Security Studies Program at MIT, and I want to welcome you to today's STAR Forum that looks at the anniversary of the, uh, Ukraine, of the beginning of the Ukraine war. I guess anniversary is not a great term and um, is going to look at the domestic implications, domestic for Russia and domestic for Ukraine of the years-long war. We have two wonderful speakers today. Uh, the first speaker is going to be Olya Onuch, who is a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Manchester in England. She's been a visiting professor at the University of Toronto and a senior research associate. And she is the author, most recently, a co-author, I should say, of the Zelensky Effect, which looks at how ordinary citizens are developing uh, civil duty and civil identity in Ukraine today. And I might add, she's quoted in today's New York Times. And our second speaker, speaker is an old friend of ours, uh, Yevgenia Albat, who is a re Russian investigative journalist, political scientist, author, and radio host. She is the editor and owner of Nove Remya New Times, a Moscow-based Russian language independent political weekly. She also hosts a show on Echo Mosvi, the Echo of Moscow, and she is currently in New York, um, having left Moscow very recently. So let me turn the floor over to uh, Olya to start our conversation. Hello to everyone, and thank you so much, Carol, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation to be with you here today. Um, before I start off with my prepared presentation, uh, I, I just want to clarify some terms. So I think for Ukrainians, um, such as myself and my family who are and friends who are currently in Ukraine and, and some folks that are at the front, um, it's very important that we call the events of the last 24 months Russia's all-out war against Ukraine. Um, and that we also acknowledge that this all-out war phase that began on February 24th, 2022, is a continuation of what is now a nine-year war of Russian aggression against Ukraine. And these things are very important to us, precisely because in order to understand what is happening uh, and to understand the roots of, of this war against Ukraine, we must understand what's been going on. Of course, this is part of a longer history of Russian aggression towards Ukraine, imperial colonialism of Ukraine and Ukrainians, but that's not what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Um, let's start off very quickly with going back to the future, if you, if you will. February 24th, 2022. Um, a date that is etched in the memory of every single Ukrainian, be they in Donetsk, Mariupol, Kiev, Kharkiv, Odessa, Lviv, elsewhere, maybe in Warsaw, maybe like myself in Manchester in England, maybe in Cambridge or in New York or Toronto. Uh, the day is etched in our memory. It is incredibly difficult to be talking to you today uh, on the anniversary of this date and with the acknowledgement that Ukraine continues to face just devastating violence, that its civilian population is not only directly affected by the destruction of their homes and their cities, but also by the deaths that are now starting to pile up higher and higher with each day, including children. And by estimates, we expect that it's anywhere between seven and 50,000 civilian deaths so far. And so with that, this is February 24th has not stopped. It continues for us every day. The shock and the feelings that we felt on that morning, calling desperately our friends and family to make sure that they are okay, to make sure that they are awake, to find out what they are doing, and the actions that everyone had to take in the days that followed. We keep reliving those days. My friends and family who are currently in Kiev, who are at the front, who 
who are in Kharkiv, who are in Lviv, they relive this day every single minute and every single hour of day. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of the extent of devastation that Ukraine has faced internally. So we have more than 8 million refugees from Ukraine recorded across Europe as of February of this year. More than 5 million people on top of that, 8 million, are estimated to be displaced inside Ukraine. It is also estimated that 17.6 million people currently inside Ukraine are in urgent need of humanitarian assistance. Of this, we have millions of children who are particularly vulnerable, and specifically uh, UNICEF and other organizations have noted just the extent of vulnerability, malnutrition, and basic care that children in Ukraine currently need. It is estimated that this is about 7.1 million children that need this urgent support. In a recent conversation with uh, psychologists, I found out that according to their studies, post-traumatic stress disorder is actually at much higher rates in the general civilian population than it is in the military population. And there could be a variety of reasons why this is happening, but already we know that the extent of post-traumatic stress disorder within Ukraine is, a, is quite high and growing amongst the civilian population. The Kyiv School of Economics estimates that the total amount of losses caused to the infrastructure of Ukraine has increased to almost 136 billion as of November of last year. This includes 143.8 thousand destroyed homes and apartment buildings. In Donetsk Oblast alone, this is 78,000 buildings or homes that have been destroyed. In Kyiv Oblast province, this is 22.8 thousand homes or buildings. And I can keep going because, of course, we know that the Russian military has specifically targeted civilian populations and civilian infrastructure. So just in heat supply facilities alone in the last few months, 592 of such facilities have been damaged. The one incredible statistic that I can give you that follows up this horrific news is that almost 300 of that, so just over half, have been already restored by the Ukrainian state and the various agencies working to do this. We know that for attacking civilian infrastructure and targeting civilian populations are war crimes. We have heard the American government representatives, but also international scholars call these acts um, crimes against humanity, but also, uh, according to other scholars, potential genocidal acts. But I want to tell you a little bit about how Ukrainians have resisted throughout this last year. You have undoubtedly seen uh, uh, Ukrainians and their tractors um, uh, uh, getting rid of military hardware from their fields. Perhaps you may have also seen Ukrainians try to stop tanks with their bare arms. And of course, you saw from the very first days of, of occupation in, in localities such as Kherson, such as Zaporizhia, people going out in quite large numbers and really surprising numbers to protest against the occupation. And of course, one might think that this is just the, the positive story that Ukrainians want to put out into the world. But the reality is that this resistance continues to this very day. So uh, one of the things that we have been engaged in with my colleagues um, uh, is to set up something called uh, data for Ukraine. Uh, you can check it out at www.dataforukraine.com. And we collect information using the Twitter API on four specific categories that are relevant to the ongoing war. Humanitarian needs across the, the whole country, 
human rights abuses across the whole of the country, uh, civilian displacement across the whole of the country, and civilian resistance across the whole of the country. And I'm not going to go into the, the, the details of how we do this, but I can answer that in the Q&A. And if you ever want to feel a glimmer of hope about Ukraine, its society, its citizens, uh, take a look at this map. We have near um, live, real-time information updated every three hours for each of the categories that I just outlined. And you can look at this map. You can take away the categories of human rights abuses, humanitarian support needs, and displacement, and you can just look for the civilian resistance. And every single day, there will be a dot on the map. At times, it is very small. At times, it is a great deal larger. But every single day, including in the occupied territories, Ukrainians are resisting their aggressor. And further data also highlight this fact. Uh, we've conducted surveys with Henry Hale over the course of this past year. Um, it, we, I was hoping to bring you some fresh data today because we have a survey in the field, but it didn't work out. But we have data from uh, May and July of this year and also in the fall. And by our estimation, about 80% of the Ukrainian civilian population is engaged in the war effort in some way. Now, this can be the regular, um, not just one-off, but regular donating of funds, volunteering in their community, engaging in civil resistance actions, civil disobedience, marches, boycotts, where they are possible or where they are needed, volunteering in the territorial defense, and engaging in armed resistance themselves. Can you imagine 80% of the civilian population answers yes, that they are directly themselves engaged in the war effort? And most of the time when social scientists ask these types of questions, multiple choice, we provide the options. We also always provide the option of other. Typically, we do not get very many other responses. But Ukrainians are giving us now hundreds of individual responses, trying to detail exactly how they are engaged in the war effort. Now, we write about this in, with Henry um, in our book, The Zelensky Effect, because we think it's incredibly powerful. I'm not saying this just to uh, inspire you. I am trying to communicate to you the extent of civic duty amongst ordinary Ukrainians, civilian population in Ukraine, and how they want their personal engagement in the war effort to be recorded. So amongst the hundreds of responses that we received, and again, I've never seen something like this before, to be perfectly honest. We have uh, making Molotov cocktails, making uh, camouflage, packing up medications, uh, foodstuffs, um, maybe some hacking even reported in the survey, which is rare again in the survey, but nonetheless. So these are the types of things we would have expected. And then you have the very personal stories. And if you can imagine, these are people who insist that the surveyor record this action. So we have an elderly person in the southeast of Ukraine who notes that they make a hearty soup and they carry it over to the forest where the military is. That is exactly the, the statement that they ask to be recorded so that our boys and girls don't fight on empty stomachs. Another individual said that they uh, got took out of the, the soil all their potatoes and carried it over again to make a donation. Another individual, again, an el elderly individual um, that was formerly in an occupied territory, said that they milked their goatlings because goatling milk is particularly high in protein. And again, the army needs good high protein milk in order to be able to fight. Now, these aren't just meant, again, as I said, to be inspirational stories. These are incredibly powerful acts of civic duty, but they also provide an incredible moral boost for the Ukrainian army. Oftentimes when people try to analyze what is going on in Ukraine and its 
quite impressive military defeats or ability to defend certain uh, cities and towns and villages. They focus on the military hardware and military tactics. And of course, those things are all important. But the secret ingredient here, uh, and perhaps Zelensky's secret weapon, are these ordinary citizens that are able not only to show the army that they are in it with them, but also provide them an incredible amount of moral support. And that does allow an army to do more, uh, perhaps in harsh circumstances, and perhaps without the right uh, hardware. The other thing I wanted to quickly mention to you is that the civic duty, this, this incredible sense of strong civic duty that we are seeing on display uh, in Ukraine amongst the civilian population is not something that is only that has only developed since February 24th. In fact, in uh, uh, multiple of our studies, we find over the last nine years that civic duty has been on the rise consistently and specifically since 2019. Increasingly, ordinary citizens have sought their duty to engage in elections, uh, to volunteer in civil society organizations, and to engage in protest. So we are seeing a little bit of a wartime rally happening amongst the Ukrainian population, but this is something that has been building over time. Thus, it is also possibly something that is far more resilient. And for those folks who are looking at these, uh, that first year of resistance, uh, 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 and, and worrying about the potential resilience of this civic duty and engagement, they can be assured that this is not simply from a wartime rally. This has been ongoing for some time. And connected to this is the continued rise in support for democracy amongst Ukrainians. Um, so we saw a, a big spike in support for democracy amongst Ukrainians over the last three years, between 2019, when Zelensky was elected uh, as president, and uh, February 16th, 2022, when we were surveying our regular uh, re uh, project surveys. In 2019, about 41% of the Ukrainian population believed that democracy was the best system for the country. On the eve of Russia's assault, uh, all-out invasion of Ukraine, February 16th, 2022, that number went to just under 16% of the population. In that three-year period, in the context of a pandemic, we have about just, just under a 20 percentage point rise. So folks in Ukraine that have lived through 30 years of transition and democratization, that did not see democracy as the best system for Ukraine began to see it in 2019 as such. And then we do see a wartime rally. Putin probably did the most important work for consolidating support for Ukrainian democracy than anyone else in Ukraine's history. By the time May 2022 comes around and July 2022, that number is in, in the high 70s of the population. Who were the movers? And this ties into the story of engagement in civilian resistance. Over the period of 2019 to just, just before the all out invasion of Ukraine, the folks that moved were of two groups. They were those who believed that under some uh, circumstances, an authoritarian government is best for Ukraine. And they were those who believed that uh, it was hard to say or, or they couldn't make their mind up. So authoritarians and those who just found it hard to say after 30 years of democratization moved sooner to supporting democracy in Ukraine. Who moved after the all-out invasion of Ukraine started? These were folks that believed up until February 2022 that for people like them, it doesn't matter whether they live in a democratic or non-democratic regime. Having that democracy forcibly taken away from them, seeing their fellow citizens live under occupation, brought them to support democracy as the best system for Ukraine. This is what is, I think, most important now when we look at the inter internal dynamics in Ukraine. 
I, uh, although I think looking at military strategy, I, uh, looking at the, the, the massive reconstruction that will be necessary in Ukraine, um, it, all these are incredibly important uh, aspects. But Ukrainians not only have shown resilience and resistance, but they have doubled down on the things that are likely to be, in, if not just simply very important, then perhaps even the most important element of uh, their fight for uh, victory. This incredible sense of a collective action to protect values and rights that are dear to them. I think that is really impressive. Um, we would expect uh, that there be populations, portions of the population that would become more polarized, more polarizing, more ethno-nationalist. And we're not actually seeing that develop in Ukraine at all. Uh, and this is the, the both the secret weapon, as I said, uh, that Zelensky has in his, uh, in his toolkit. But it's also potentially an Achilles heel for any politician that oversteps. Ukrainians are not willing to negotiate. Uh, they're not willing to give up any of their uh, territories. So Ukrainian, the general Ukrainian population, we're talking at 80 to 90 percent, would like to see the territorial integrity of Ukraine fully restored to its 1991 borders inclusive of, uh, obviously, Luhansk and Donetsk in full, but also Crimea. And this is where the, the, the potential problems for political elite arise. They cannot negotiate that which they cannot deliver. Because Zelensky is not the one that is building the nation. He is not the one that's making the democratic Ukrainian nation. In fact, the democratic Ukrainian nation is what made him who he is today. And without their support, he simply will not be able to deliver on any negotiations. And this is why I think you see him taking such a hard and strong line on this. So uh, I think I'll end my remarks there. An ongoing tragedy, uh, incredible uh, resilience and resistance. Uh, and it's not really about the political elite, elite and leaders. It's about the ordinary Ukrainian citizens that are willing to fight. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great portrait of what's happening and the dynamics within um, Ukraine today. Zhenya, uh, over to you. You cut me off. Yes. Okay. Can you see me? Yep. Okay, great. Very nice. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, MIT. Thank you very much, uh, Carol and everyone involved. Thank you for inviting me to uh, talk at this uh, distinguished um, forum. But before I say anything else, let me say that uh, I feel ashamed and sorry for what my country, Russia, of which I am a citizen of, has done to Ukraine, in Ukraine and to its people. I am truly sorry for that. I am ashamed of that. And I bear responsibility that Russian opposition failed to stop Putin before he went into this awful war and destruction of two countries at once. Uh, now, uh, talking about, I was asked to speak about the situation in uh, Russia. Uh, 12 months after, um, after the war started, you know, of course, the, uh, the biggest suffering is in Ukraine, hundreds of thousands dead on both sides, uh, cities destroyed, uh, infrastructure destroyed, lives destroyed. Mm. In Russia, uh, the regime has turned into a repressive one, as it was so expected. In fact, you know, I uh, just looked at the presentation I made at MIT right before um, you went under COVID restrictions, uh, and it was the presentation about the development of uh, Putin's regime right after Putin conducted coup d'etat, uh, out of the affair, as they say it in, uh, in Latin America, when he rewrote a uh, constitution in accordance with his own uh, uh, needs. 
And the end, the last slide was, it will get worse before it will get uh, better. And I think uh, by then in 2020, it became already clear that Putin is a, was aiming at the war. And of course, he was aiming at the war in Ukraine. In fact, you know, he used Syria as a place, as a polygon to prepare for that uh, war. So what we have in Russia now is we have, you know, um, uh, we have a dictatorship. Uh, however, it yet to become a Stalinist type of regime, uh, uh, though we should expect that it may evolve into worse uh, forms of repression. The latest numbers suggest that there were initiated 187 criminal cases for on charges of so-called spreading of disinformation about the Russian army, that is the coverage of its atrocities in Ukraine. Uh, Carol, you mentioned uh, that I was the editor and owner of the New Times. The New Times was blocked three days into the war. Uh, I ran an, a, a talk show uh, at Echo Moscow, the only liberal station uh, left by then, uh, for 19 straight years. It was named, it was called Absolute Alberts, and this was closed 10 days into the war. The New Times kept working and keeps working, even though people in Russia should use VPN to read us. And as a result, I was indicted, indicted on four counts for um, spreading misinformation uh, about the Russian army. Uh, that was the coverage of the war in Ukraine, specifically uh, in the verdict that was written that we wrote about Russian army bombing Kharkiv and Lugansk and Dnipro and uh, Odessa, and that was apparently disinformation. Uh, we also were charged with disinformation about Russian army killing civilians all across Ukraine, and also it was also assumed as disinformation. Why? Because Minister of Defense never mentioned on its website that Russian army bombed those cities in Ukraine, and never mentioned uh, civilians also. Why Minister of Defense never mentioned? Because Commanding Chief said that uh, it wasn't the war, it was a special military operation, uh, which aimed in preventing Ukraine to invade Russia. So for that, I was uh, indicted and uh, fined uh, at the amount of 790,000 rubles, which is approximately $14,000. Uh, and that's why, and then later in uh, early August, I was pronounced a foreign agent working on behalf of Ukraine, believe you or not. So, and that's how, you know, I, after that, you know, my lawyers in no terms told me that next was going to be a jail time, so I left Russia. However, some of my friends were not that lucky or decided to stay no matter what, as Ilya Yashin did, uh, who gave, got eight years and six months in penal colony for producing a video piece on crimes committed by the Russian troops in Bucha, uh, in the suburbs of Kiev. Uh, so, uh, and uh, as we speak, he is in jail. My another friend, Alexei Navalny, was sentenced to nine years at the maximum security penal, penal colony uh, for being the first critic of Putin. During uh, uh, all these uh, months in jail, he made uh, endless anti-war uh, speeches. Now he is himself half Ukrainian, his father is Ukrainian, and a lot of his family is spread all across Ukraine. So, uh, and his imprisonment is turned into every day torch. Uh, 20,000 people in Russia were arrested for their protest of the war in Ukraine. 6,000 Russians were accused on, on so called administrative charges, like me, something like misdemeanor in the United States. 
uh, 149 different media organizations and media outlets uh, were uh, banned in the Russian Federation. 59 media organizations in Russia pronounced as foreign agents. Obviously, my New Times is uh, one of them. Uh, 189 individuals were pronounced uh, as foreign agents. As I said, I'm one of them. And as it was stated uh, in the document that we received from the Minister of Justice, you know, all of us who were working uh, basically on behalf of Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, uh, as of now, uh, Russia doesn't have any civil society left because as a result of uh, right after the beginning of the war and then where after September 21st, when Putin announced mass mobilization, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of Russians left. There are different estimates of how many Russians are now outside the country. Uh, uh, and the numbers are all the way from 1 million to 2 uh, million, but that's uh, those people who were uh, able to leave, who have some means to survive outside their home country, who have money to rent, and who have some skills to sell on the market, so to uh, get their bread and butter. Uh, so these are the people who most likely constituted the, the uh, active protest that existed in Russia uh, or until the war uh, started. The development uh, also, you know, the as all each and every uh, opposition media outlet uh, got closed, uh, everything was substituted with the propaganda channel. However, it's also true that Russia became the second country after India in terms of the amount of VPN downloaded uh, virtual private networks, which allow, allow you to read what is prohibited inside Russia, uh, which were downloaded by uh, inside Russia by uh, Russian people. Uh, to be honest with you, I still struggling to understand uh, how the nation uh, which lost 27 million people in the war with Nazi Germany, turned into aggressor uh, uh, state, which conducts this genocidal war in the neighboring country, Ukraine. 11 million Russians have their first degree relatives in Ukraine. Many of us have our roots in Ukraine. My grandmother was born uh, in, 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 in a Khmelnytsky district uh, in Ukraine. Uh, my father, Mark Elvis, uh, fought Germans uh, uh, during the Nazi invasion uh, in the city of Mykolaiv. I was there. So now Federal Republic of Germany provides tanks to fight uh, Russian invaders in Ukraine. Uh, to, cut the long, to, to cut this painful story short, uh, there are lots to, for us to understand about uh, about the silence on the part of the uh, Russian society. I think one thing it was is clear cut that uh, this war was at the cut the minute Putin was chosen as a successor to Putin and the minute the KGB operator became the president of uh, Russia. I've been doing you know tons of presentations all across the globe. Uh, which was titled Putin's Silent Coup, trying to convince that uh, members of the uh, of the, the graduates of the KGB, um, whom I call you know, members of this corporation, were taking all the most important positions in the Russian government and in the state-affiliated monopolies and corporations. They got at uh, their control uh, all kind of uh, most lucrative businesses which stuff the coffins like oil and gas and uh, money inflow and outflow. But they also use this money to rebuild uh, Russian military industrial complex and prepare for, for the war. Uh, we do know that uh, Putin first annexed 20% of, of territory of Georgia in 2008, 
and basically, uh, uh, you know, was just, you know, padded a little bit. He was said that, you know, he shouldn't do this, but that was it. Uh, and he realized that he uh, could do whatever he wanted in so-called Russian sphere of interest. Next, uh, of course, was the annexation of Crimea in 2014 and uh, beginning of the war, which of course started in Donbass back in 2014. Once again, uh, all kinds of sanctions were introduced against Russia and then they were dropped uh, as uh, sanctions were dropped after the um, annexation of Abkhazia and uh, South Ossetia after the war with uh, Georgia. I don't want to say that uh, or it is the West to be blamed uh, for this war. Of course, you know, uh, we Russian citizens who allowed for this regime to uh, thrive are responsible first and foremost for what's going on. However, I think it's also important, it's also failure on the part of political science and Russian field to see uh, the dangers that uh, came out of uh, preserving the, the old institutions of the Soviet Union. This war was inevitable. And it, basically, if we look in the history of these type regimes, we do see that after all the fire, they usually go into wars. So uh, I think I will stop here. I will be happy uh, to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Yevgenia and Olga. These are fantastic presentations. So I often, Carol and I will be taking questions. I'm Elizabeth Wood, Professor of History at MIT. Um, and we usually uh, moderate the question from the audience, but we often ask one question from ourselves to start with. And since we are at MIT, though we have a much larger audience, we have 379 people on this call. I'm curious if each of you can speak of what people at MIT uh, can do to help. Or if I, you mentioned, especially this wonderful data for ukraine.com, and you talked about civilian resistance, but I would love it if you talk a little bit about humanitarian needs um, and civilian uh, needs that we could be helping with at MIT. Um, we have a new MIT Ukraine program that is mobilizing students and faculty to work on topics that are of interest. We had a question on the chat about um, dual use uh, technologies that maybe could be used. And it would, I think it would be very helpful for all of us to hear how can we help. Maybe it's donating, maybe it's developing new technologies. I'd love to hear your perspective. And then maybe, Zhenya, you could also speak briefly, can we do anything to help Russia? Um, I'm obviously much more worried about Ukraine, but uh, the question of what, what uh, you know, the, the Russian civil society is a mess. So um, how, can, how can we help? But Olga, you, maybe you can answer first. Thank you. Um, yes, so I think most importantly is not to replicate action, but to work collaboratively and complement. Um, so there are already incredibly, well, uh, I mean, a, a variety of Ukrainian organized, Ukrainian led initiatives and joining those I think is a, is a good first step. So if you are a scholar that works on misinformation, disinformation, and uses big data, uh, the, um, there is a strategic communications outlet in the army. If you are so inclined to cooperate with the Ukrainian army, this is one uh, place that you can work uh, with. And you can develop, like, like we have, uh, using Twitter um, Open API. Uh, and open data sources uh, also. Uh, there are multiple initiatives at uh, institutions such as the Kiev School of Economics that I would encourage people to check out. Um, everything from, uh, I mean, they, they, they do everything from crunching numbers and, and uh, 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 analyzing things through the lens of economists, but also working with a variety of scientists on at this moment, we are just providing um, the, the word just escaped my uh, generators to schools. But what can we do in 
outside of providing generators? Is there another technology that can be used? Is there something else that we can develop uh, to support schools? Um, there are Ukrainian organizations that are also co collaborating with Kiev School of Economics, but also directly with the president's administration on developing, and this is awful to say, but uh, specialized um, bulletproof jackets for children when, because when you evacuate uh, schools and children directly from um, the 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 contact line or directly from a, a town that's uh, engaged in very hot exchanges. We don't have things to put children in, and yet children are directly shot at, right? So these are the sorts of technologies that uh, are being developed by scientists. And, you know, I, I, without, there's so many that I can't list them all, but it, I would actually just encourage scholars and scientists to look at what is already being done there's a team out of Stanford also doing a variety of things and to collaborate, not replicate uh, necessarily, because I think uh, that happened a little bit in the first few months where we were replicating a lot of our actions and we're far stronger and, and better, uh, well, we, we reach better ends when we work together um, and specifically centering Ukrainian voices in the process. So you might have a skill set that is important. You might have a technology that is relevant, uh, but looking to Ukrainian partners on how to develop that technology forward. Just to give you the example of data for Ukraine, it is a combination of scholars uh, who uh, some work on the region, some do not work on the region, some are data scientists, some are not data scientists, but we combined our efforts and without the Ukrainian speakers and the team, we wouldn't have been able to do this work, but without the data scientists and their labs, we also wouldn't be able to do the work. Um, and this collaborative effort allowed four different projects, four different labs to do something that is being used by organizations, um, including um, the OECD and others. Right. Uh, Zhenya, I wanted to ask you, well, let me put it this way. There's a great contrast between what Olya described and what you've described in terms of the activism of the Ukrainian population versus this description that we all see in the press every day of the passivity of the Russian population. What is your sense, not of the civil activists, yourself included, but what is your sense of the population, the average citizen of Russia's response to the war? Um, do more of them share your view that this is a crime, but they're just afraid to express it? Or is it really this picture of the propaganda is working and there's sort of no hope of uh, um, any kind of uprising or any kind of protest against the regime? I cannot thank you for your question. Um, before the war, you know, the last more or less coherent uh, poll we had in Russia uh, was. Uh, uh, in uh, in uh, October of 2021, it suggested that uh, Putin's popular rating was about 30%. Uh, since then, we don't have uh, any real polls. The response rate is 5%. So basically, those who are afraid to answer, and now it's a crime to say that you're against the war, or, you know, I was indicted for using the word war and a nation. They're both prohibited by uh, Russian censorship. So uh, you couldn't expect really people to say what uh, they mean. Now, uh, imagine for a sec, uh, Carol, that you wake up each morning, like I did um, for several months on the road. Um, I kept my balcony open. And I was waking up each morning uh, trying to figure out whether the car which stopped by my entrance, whether it was an FSB car which came to conduct a search and to arrest me or not. Hmm. And you like, live like that every day. Each evening, you turn on all your computers and try to figure out where if there is any possibility, at least to say one phone somewhere, can I put it underneath something or it's useless? 
before Ilya Yashin was jailed in July of 2022, uh, I asked him to come to my place and we walked around my apartment and we were trying to figure out where can I uh, put uh, my laptops and my phones so when they come to search my house, they wouldn't uh, find them. And then we came to the conclusion there was one place and probably it was good only for one form. And that's Carol, how you live day after day. And you know that all your uh, communications are taped, uh, that whenever you have any guests, uh, they're probably also taped. You never know who comes to your house. When you leave your house and get you into the car, you are followed all around. Uh, when they closed, uh, shut down the majority of uh, independent websites in the regions, it, it became impossible to understand what was going on in the regions of the Russian Federation. So what I used to do, I was getting into my car and I just drove to different places. Very clean, Pskov, or Novgorod, you know, all around Russia. In order to, and what I did, I, I, I went to the markets and asked people uh, there, and uh, I tried to ask people on the streets. I also tried to find some friends or colleagues who helped me to meet with some people. When I came to, at some point, to the city Novgorod, beautiful city, uh, and I didn't book my uh, hotel ahead of time on purpose because I'm a very experienced person, right? So, and I, uh, so I went into this uh, hotel and in the evening I had a meeting with, uh, with some person who lived, who lived in Luka. And he came in and said, you came up, you know, there is an Eiffel car in front and they are, uh, making pictures of each and every one. Hmm. And I'm sorry, you know, I, they already fixed me, but I cannot ask my friends to come. And then the next uh, three days that I was in Novgorod, this car was driving my car all around, everywhere. It was done openly on purpose just to show me that don't dare. And of course, you know, I was, you know, the, the, the number one rule for journalists. You don't put in danger your source. So um, that's why, Carol, it's not about, you know, passivity of Russian people. Just, I would just ask you, imagine for a sec that you live in this kind of environment on a daily basis. Uh, you can say, uh, I can tell you that in my closed bubble, those who left and those who, who are still uh, in Russia for different prisons. Everyone, each and every one is against the wall. What can they do? If you go on the street, people were arrested for having just a white of thing alone and having just white piece of paper, nothing. Or having in their hand, you know, the Russian credit card called Mir. So it is a very repressive regime. But what is worse than that is that those who are capable to lead these possible protests, uh, Putin, he's a smart guy, he's a smart son of a bitch, and his KGB guys spend life developing uh, skills and, and techniques uh, how to deal with opposition. That's why. He tried to kill Navalny in 2020, and that's why the minute Navalny uh, entered Russia, came back to Russia on January 14th, uh, 2021, he put him in jail. Precisely because people live by example. People need some, uh, some leaders who can tell them, guys, I'm with you on the streets, you know, uh, don't be afraid, or even if you're afraid, we should overcome this. When Navalny came back to Russia, people came out in the streets, even though it was very, very cold. Uh, 28 degrees, minus 28 degrees centigrade. 
uh, people came on the streets in nine, uh, 193 cities all across Russia. And they traveled later on, you know, to different cities, to Volgograd, to Saratov, to Samara, and etc. And everywhere I was told, never before we saw so many people on the streets. Navalny was seen as somebody who was capable to overcome. He, he to put the threat to kill him, and he survived. It was, you know, it was uh, uh, almost a biblical, you know, uh, story. So, uh, but they put him in jail, and they put Ilya Yashin, who also time and again, Navashin, like, Yashin was asked, "Are you going to leave?" And Yashin kept saying, "No, I'm not going to leave." They uh, brought, you know, three misdemeanors against uh, Ilya Yashin. He refused to leave. Uh, uh, he, the interrogator, his interrogator, told him. We were telling you, leave. And you just decided to stay. And he decided to stay because he's a politician, like his job description. Evgeny Roitman, a, a, a well known politician in uh, Yekaterinburg, the city in the Round Mountains, once again shut down. You know, he's, uh, there is a criminal case against him. He's under house arrest, no access to internet, no to anything. Now, you would say that, that uh, uh, my fellow citizens, their cause, they are. Apparently, these uh, 30 years, first of turbulence, then of, you know, of more or less a key life, Russians never lived that well as they lived before 2014. You know, they never received that amount of money, never in the history of Russia. They got sold out. Uh, for this. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. But given that I am now in the lecture of New York University facing the, you know, what is it, 19th place and 8th street, I wouldn't blame those who stay there. Because I myself uh, packed my suitcase, got the most important of my books, and, you know, and left. And I lost Carol, everything. I'm 64 year old. I'm homeless. I will be, and you know, basically jobless. All my books are back there in Russia, and I have uh, nothing left. It's not an easy life to be an immigrant, even with my PhD from Harvard and uh, from with everything else. So to cut the long story short, no. We know from the history of other regimes of that kind that the countries with, which had the same similar regime, especially in Latin America, they are not going to be any popular uprising. This is going to be elite politics, and sooner or later, elites will realize that costs of uh, prolonging this awful war uh, have become unbearable to them. In this case. I don't know what they're going to do to Putin. Don't ask me to say this. Uh, but you know, we know from the history of Russia uh, that there were all kind of means and ways how to uh, stop uh, some zas um, from being zas. Uh, so anyway, to cut the long story short, there will be some sort of a coup d'état. Uh, though, uh, don't expect that uh, that. Uh, this will bring democratic politicians in power. But at least, you know, this it's very important because, you know, it will allow to break this spell of the uh, all powerful uh, dictator. So that's my answer to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zhenya. So um, let's turn to a question that's been much in the chat. Um, and I'd like to ask Olya to comment. Uh, people are asking, how can the war end? What might be any terms that the Ukrainians are willing to settle for? Obviously, I know well that uh, I have not yet met a single Ukrainian who's willing to give up any territory, but is there any way that you can see an end to the war? What what would it need and what would it take? And maybe you also want to respond to what you've been saying. Yeah, Elizabeth, I, I think I, it's really important. And Evgenia, I, I, Evgenia, I, I, I just Ukrainianized your name, if you don't mind. Um, uh, but 
in no way to disparage uh, the work that you've done or that your colleagues have done, but I, I, you really cannot compare the, the repression uh, against activists and opposition in Russia to the plight of Ukrainians. And quite frankly, it's insulting to the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians that did show up on their own protest squares and were shot at by snipers to be told that it's Russia who is only the repressive state. And this is why its citizens don't um, turn out onto the streets. In fact, we can... I can just as many names as were mentioned, and, and I think that Vine is not the most exceptional character because he has a checkered past on his comments when it comes to Ukraine's territorial integrity, although that has changed in, indeed. But uh, certainly, I mean, Ukrainian, even not, not, not talking about Ukrainian dissidents, but just talking about independence era Ukraine, we have had some incredibly repressive periods. Just the things that you have described were the things that were occurring under Kuchma. Um, Gongadze was not only killed, but beheaded, in fact. And so I, I think this is not, it's, it doesn't, just because there is repression in Russia, it doesn't excuse an action. And uh, there are actual surveys that are being conducted, problematic as they may be. There are experimental survey designs that are being used in Russia to get at maybe getting people to say their true preferences and not so much their falsified um, preferences or reporting what they think. And we still know that using experimental designs, there is a large percentage of the population that simply sees this as a just war as well. And whether that is 40% or 30% or 60%, this is a large proportion of ordinary Russians that sees Ukraine in a different hierarchical state to Russia, that sees Ukrainians as a people in a different hierarchical state to Russians, and that are okay with this that are okay with an imperial um, vision. And, and they are in fact supporting this and we can't deny that. Furthermore, what happens to Russian opposition or those who have fled Russian repression but are now in London and Berlin, in DC, in New York, in Toronto, why haven't we seen large actions but rather very small actions? Uh, Berlin has a large Russian population but we have not actually seen large Russian-led anti-war demonstrations. So I think the story is a little bit more complex than simply repression. Um, and one thing I would like to note when it comes to Russia, Putin is one man. We do know that the Siloviki have been divided. They have found unity over the past year. But we do know that there have been key differences of approaches throughout uh, the period, starting with uh, Crimean annexation up until 2022. There are different military strategies. There is disagreement. I think it's up to us in the West, those of us who study uh, security, those of us who work in policy, those of us who have the capacity to engage in this debate, to find exactly where those weaknesses are amongst the Soloviki on the military or the Secret Service side and expose them and actually make use of them. And I think that hasn't been done enough, perhaps, so far. Um, it, I, I think this was just really important for me to say out loud because uh, it is really difficult to hear, especially when I have family members who have been dissidents for years, who have, you know, folks who have been sent to psychiatric hospitals. Uh, we knew other um, activists that are friends and family that, as I said, uh, that have been um, killed, uh, and they've done it nonetheless. And I really hope that more Russians will be able to do the same in Russia. Uh, and if not, then I think Russians really need to do more introspectively what is wrong with their friends and family if they can allow the, the assault on children and innocent civilians on a daily basis. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, Elizabeth, but I, I did not get to your question, um, but I know we're running out of time. Uh, is there an end to the war? I think every Ukrainian would answer the question in the same manner. I think most policy analysts uh, understand that if Russia stops fighting, the war ends tomorrow. Um, that is simply the case. In terms of negotiations, I undoubtedly understand that there will be some. 
Uh, I cannot see them being fruitful anytime soon, uh, not least because the military momentum is on Ukraine's side. Uh, we all know Russia strategically and militarily has lost the war it set out to embark on in February. It has lost that version of the war. It has now changed tactics. We have seen more missiles, of course, uh, aerial bombings, um, and we expect that to continue. Um, I do not, a year ago on February 23rd, I was live on television. I was asked on BBC World News, what do I expect the war to look like? Should it uh, start? And I then believe that this would be a multi-year conflict that doesn't actually have an easy end, that doesn't end in a simple negotiation. And even if Zelensky or a different leader would negotiate some kind of territorial agreement, there is enough of the proportion of the Ukrainian citizens that will not allow that to take place. There will be partisan uh, fighting. There will be combat groups of various kinds. Uh, that I think is far more dangerous for the stability and security of the region. Um, and so I just don't see this ending anytime soon. Um, but again, uh, Russia could uh, end the war tomorrow. Great. Um Zhenya, can we ask you the same question? Can we um, ask you what might be acceptable to the Russian leadership if we get to a negotiation, or is this just sort of war in perpetuity uh, as long or as until Putin is removed from power? I don't know, Carol. I'm thinking about what Olga said. I do understand that, you know, it's pretty easy to blame one Russian uh, for what's happening back uh, across the ocean. You know, Olga, I've been many, many times to Ukraine. I covered a hell of a lot of stories from there. I traveled all around Ukraine in 2017, and my fellow Russians were asking me, Zhenya, where are you going, you know? Uh, and I kept writing, listen, you know, I never had, you know, any, you know, bad eye anywhere here. I can tell you that, of course, it's impossible, you know, from just, you know, the, from the historical point of view, from the scholarly point of view, it's impossible to equalize Ukraine under Kuchma uh, with a uh, regime of the uh, KGB, which exists in the contemporary Russia. Yes, of course, you know, we all of us, we know about the case of Gangadze, and of course we know about that. But uh, the biggest difference from the political science of view between Ukraine and Russia is that in Ukraine, Ukraine is a, is a perfect case of a weak state and strong society. And that's what really, when we say, you know, uh, why uh, Ukraine is not Russia, rephrasing Kuchma's book, which was here, yeah, which was both. It is, I think, the most important thing that uh, Ukraine has a very strong society as a, and quite uh, weak uh, central government. Mm. The uh, opposite in uh, the opposite in uh, Russia, but of course, you know. Uh, uh, the problem of Russia is that the most repressive institution of the Soviet Union, the KGB, was brought into power in 2000, in, uh, 2000 by a greedy and corrupted Russian elite. Everything else was the perfect outcome of that. You know, Olga, how many people in this country, the United States, kept telling me, oh, Evgeny, you're so biased. You're biased you're because you're writing about KGB your entire life. Your boy, you know, Putin is a listen, Russia needs a strong hand, you know. Really, it's you know, look, you know, you know, the, the you know, he's doing so well, you know, investing in infrastructure. He finally shut, you know, calm down oligarchs, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You know how many the wisest people in Washington, DC, in Cambridge, and etc., were telling me that no, 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 Putin is exactly what Russia needed. And they kept telling me, you just don't understand the nature of this machine. They are going to be go 
much, much worse. And they present, he, Putin, presents a danger to the entire world. And of course, you know, now everybody all of a sudden, you know, woke up and said, oh God, you know, what's son of But he was like that. He made it clear in 2007 in Munich, and then in 2008 in Georgia, and then in 2013 uh, when he supported Yanukovych, and then in 2014 when he annexed Crimea and started the war in Donbass. It was the moment. It was coming. So now, am I responsible for Russians? Yes, probably yes. I'm responsible because. Uh, you know, because this is my country, I'm citizen of this country. Uh, as for, uh, and um, I'm a great supporter of Alexei Navalny. And if we have any hope in any leadership, uh, then it is him. And if West can do any good for uh, Russia, it is to help to get him out of uh, jail before they kill him. Uh, so what's going to happen in the Russian polls, as I said, uh, it's going to be, you know, my, I think, you know, just judging because, you know, I teach uh, autocratic regimes and uh, now I teach in uh, NYU, uh, we see that what that's what happened in uh, many uh, Latin American countries. There are all kinds of coup d'etats, you know, it's a regime of bureaucratic authoritarian or bureaucratic military authoritarianism. So, uh, you know, people in Appalachia, they do need expertise that comes from the technocrats. However, it's the question of cost. So when costs become unbearable, elites will kick out Putin and uh, will bring uh, somebody, almost likely it will be a coalition, uh, which will uh, run Russia until um, something better happens. I don't expect anything to happen uh, soon, but you know, it's impossible. You know, I don't know how to read the crystal ball. So let me try one more question for Olya, and then we should probably start to wrap up. Um, one of the questions in the chat was, do we know anything about the regions of Ukraine that are under Russian occupation? Uh, Mariupol, Crimea, Donbass, the Nest Luhansk. How are people living? Um, what's what's happening um, on the ground there? And then maybe we should have each of you give one final final comment and, and begin to wrap up. Uh, just Yevgenia, I don't know if you know, but I'm actually an expert that compares Latin American and East European experiences. So you're speaking uh, uh, very much in my I agree that there's things that we can learn from Latin American authoritarianism, but rather uh, on why people do and do not engage in protest uh, in these different um, different uh, uh, authoritarian states in Latin America and compared to Russia. Uh, on the question of folks that live, and I don't know why I said folks now three times or four times throughout the presentation, it has caught somehow into my head. Um, on people living in occupied territories, there's limited information. Uh, it does come through sometimes. Uh, there are certainly there's certainly some communication between some individuals. This was the case uh, in in people living in Kherson. This was the case in people living in the occupied territories in Kharkiv. Um, obviously, what happens in the case of Bucha is that you all of a sudden have a period of time when there is no communication occurring. Um, and that's obviously the most uh, violent and repressive period or a period where people are in basements and have no uh, access to their mobile phones or do not have a way to get any electricity. We do have some information and it's, 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 it's not positive, um, of course, uh, but we do also have information about continued partisan resistance. And there has been some actual uh, scholarly research on partisan resistance in occupied territories. And what's actually happening is that the partisan resistance groups have a way of communicating with uh, the Ukrainian state and military in different ways. Um, I'm not necessarily privy to those uh, that information, but it's 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 really it's surprisingly robust. Um, and there are 
multiple different aggrupations. So in Donetsk, there's a separate one to the one in uh, Kherson, to the one in Zaporizhia. Uh, but nonetheless, they are finding ways to communicate with each other um, or between the state and themselves. And of course, citizens are doing a variety of acts. So we do get ever so often um, from occupied Kherson, we get uh, photos of somebody having painted the Ukrainian flag in different locations across uh, a particular town. Or um, posters coming up in Zaporizhia that say, uh, you know, how many kilometers you have to go to go home back to rostov on -Don, and these kinds of things. So people are still finding ways to do that. And then to obviously send out images of those acts of resistance to us. So uh, aside from the fact that we know people are being repressed, people are being watched, people are being controlled in many ways, people are being threatened, uh, abused, uh, tortured, uh, nonetheless, there is some information that comes out. I have to say that when we collect data on repression, we do get some information from occupied territories. Uh, and people do find ways to use encrypted mobile devices and, and uh, VPNs and so on to get out a text or two, and even do so on social media platforms, specifically Telegram. So um, I do think we said we would go to 3.15, so we should probably wrap up. Um, let's see, uh, Jenya, do you want to have a last word and then one to a last word too? Oh, no, I'm very grateful for uh, you inviting me. You know, uh, it's not an extremely pleasant experience, but you know, I guess uh, that's what you get if you fail. And that's true. Russian position failed. We did. We lost. We fight very hard. Um, by the way, Olga, no, I don't think that Russians see uh, Ukrainians as uh, inferior people. Putin does, yes. Putin does, obviously. He's a fascist. It's clear cut. Uh, however, uh, I think that once again, there are 11 million Russians, I mean, there are 11 million citizens of the Russian Federation who have first degree relatives in Ukraine. We're talking about 30, probably 40 million uh, members of the families who have their relatives in uh, Russia, so in, in Ukraine. So no, there is no this upside down approach to Ukraine. That's a different thing. And you know, all this, it's more complicated than that. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, I just today I had a conversation with somebody um, that, you know, Ruski is an adjective, right? Ukrainian is noun. Ruski is adjective. And, you know, uh, Russia has to, Russia is facing a necessity to become a nation state in order to stop, you know, seeing itself as, a, as an empire. Uh, Yes, for some Russians, you know, especially in the impoverished regions of the Russian Federation, you know, they, it's sort of compensation for their miserable life. You know, their life is awful, but at least they can say, well, you know, we are going to show all those, you know, everywhere that we are Russians. So what? They're pity people. No. I really, I hate to blame uh, ordinary uh, people. I do believe that elites are responsible for what's happening. But people who live, you know, for trying to survive, you know, how can we blame that? Anyway, but that's all for what happened, of course. I'm going to be, by the way, I'm flying to Ukraine. I'm hopeful it. I'm flying to Ukraine, you know, this kind of week. Mm. Oh, yeah, one last word quickly, and then we should probably wrap up and thank everybody. I mean, I think it's obvious that Yevgenia and I are on the same side of, of history, and 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 obviously uh, Yevgenia is an ally to Ukrainians. Um, but at the same time, 
I do think that ordinary citizens who are engaged in the war effort currently on the Russian side who perpetrate acts that might be considered war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocidal acts are to blame themselves as well. And it's not simply just the elites that have put them in that place. Uh, and this is where the complicated situation unfolds. There are ordinary Russians killing also ordinary Ukrainians. And perhaps it is merely because elites enacted uh, or, or, or started uh, this war nine years ago or earlier, or perhaps that's not just simply the case. And I, I, I have to say that, it, of course, those who give the orders under law, international law, would be uh, blamed for these atrocities, but so would those who perpetrate them. Uh, and I think that is, that is uncomfortable, that is horrific, um, but that is the truth. Uh, and I hope that in years from now, we can have the same conversation and where my doubts about some ordinary Russians are in fact uh, no longer there. Um, but currently my experiences also personally having traveled many times to Russia uh, are not necessarily those of yours. And uh, I hope that in the future that we see more eye to eye on these things and that there is peace in Ukraine above all. Yeah. So I think we should wrap up, but incredible thanks to both our speakers, Olya and Virginia, for an, a fascinating and very, very important conversation, debate, disagreement, heartfelt feelings. Um, these are very, very difficult things. And, um, Let's hope for peace. Let's hope for connection between the two nations at some day in the future, both individuals and collectives. And let's also thank our sponsors, the Star Forum, Michelle English and Sabina Von Mel, who've done a fantastic job for all the audience, for their questions, for coming. Um, stay in touch and we will see you the next time. All best. Bye. Bye, thank you.